Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody out there in podcast land. It is another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And back by popular demand, I mean, we had him on a couple of weeks ago, and he, he was very gracious in giving us his backstory. I really wanted to uncover, you know, a lot of a backstory instead of just a quick snapshot of his life because he's covered so much. And in this podcast, I'd like to talk about how there, it, there's a school of thought that everyone, when they incarnate, they have about five exits that they can choose, like uh, consciously or subconsciously. And this is before Michael even had any near-death experiences. And I kind of let the cat out of the bag. We have Michael Tamora back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Well, before we get started, welcome back to the podcast, Michael. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you guys. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. And so, yeah, there's, there's a school of thought that when we incarnate, we have, you know, five exit points in our lives that we could choose, you know, something will happen and we could choose whether or not to transition. And in a lot of the podcast last time we spoke, it, to me, at least, there were some notice, noticeable episodes that you chose not to you continue to uh, you know, live your life. But then later on in life, you started having these absolute near-death experiences, five to be exact, and you're still here. So I want to <laughs> cover some time of, of actually going through uh, some of your exit points. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> yes, it's like they say cats have nine lives. And I, I'm practicing to be able to reincarnate as a cat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I never heard the uh, specific school of thought that we all have five exit points in life. What I've experienced looking at many different people, that many different souls incarnated, that I'd say... Uh, there's anywhere from one to about five exit points that some of us choose prior to our birth and everything for the coming lifetime. And those, what I call windows of opportunity, are where we go, okay, are we done? Are, are we you know, happy with where we're at and this is a good way to exit now? Or do I want to continue and um, go further? Or I haven't gotten to where I want to get to in this lifetime yet, so I'll pass this one up and go to the next one and things like that. Or sometimes we have these exit points where life, especially if we're coming into a lifetime that's very challenging and souls need a way out of Okay, I, I bit off a little more than I can chew in this life, and I've had it. It's, just, it's too much. Uh, get me out of here. So it's like mayday, mayday, <laughs> get me out of here. And, and then they will uh, let you, when you come to that first uh, window of opportunity and you just want out, you can go out. So in my experience this time, the very first um, uh, death experience I had was on the technical end of things. It was very simple. I was in excruciating pain. And um, uh, do you guys know what gout is? Uh, yeah. It's Somewhere. a condition. Yeah. And most people, when they get it, um, it's, it's in their ankle or their big toe or something like that. And I've had it in those places earlier 
in my life when I first started. But at this point, uh, which was 2004, uh, early part of 2004, I started getting it, and I traveled. And later on, I found out from somebody else who had it. It's called traveling gout, and it just travels all over the body. And for some people, it travels around the body, settles into different joints, and, and it's terrible. It's just, I would say it's the most excruciating uh, pain I've ever went, gone through. And, um, and until then, I used to be, even doctors would say, gee, you have such a high pain threshold. Mm-hmm. When you're, what, what would be, you know, knocking somebody flat on their back, you still go keep on going. But this kind of pain, I couldn't. It's, it, was, it was terrible. And having it practic by the time I went out, uh, I had it in every uh, joint, even the sutures in the top of my skull, in the little bones in my ear, all kinds of places. It's just excruciating pain. And it was the kind of pain where I, I'm really looking at it. Wow, um, I can really tell. I feel like if you were being punished and tortured, it's, it's, it would be like this or worse. And, um, mm. and it went on and on and on for days. Uh, by that point, it was going on for about, the severe part was going on for about a week. But, you know, lesser parts were going on before that. And I already been to doctors and everything about this condition and, and the drugs and things like that they can prescribe just not only didn't help, but it made it worse. So I, I didn't even go there. So I'm at home and uh, I'm trying to find anything that would make it a little bit less even. And position-wise, I can stand I can walk, I can lie on the floor, I can lie on the bed, I could be in a fetal position, I could sit down. Nothing changed anything. It was just as bad. And so I'm on the on the bed. Raphael's out uh, doing errands or getting groceries or whatever. And so I'm home alone. (laughs) And I get to the point where I'm just, it's like minute by minute. And I'm going, I don't know. And I finally go, hey, God, I don't know if I can, how much longer I can handle this. And then, boom, instantly, I'm out. Um, Hmm. It wasn't until I returned later that I I realized, oh, my heart stopped. And uh, I just got, basically, I got escorted out. It was just like, I asked this, I got escorted out. And I get taken to this beautiful room. What I thought of after I came back is, oh, it was like a divine conference room, like a divine boardroom. You know, some of those really fancy boardrooms of big major corporations, they're very fancy, right? Yeah. Beautiful hardwood table, you know, polished to a sheen. Well, this place had this hardwood table gorgeous and and the room was just elegant it wasn't huge but elegant and this long conference table and I get escorted to sit down there's one seat and the one end of the conference table and there's five other incredible beings magnificent beings sitting in five seats and there's one by the close to the right around the corner from the head of the table open and they said welcome and I sit down they have me sit down and they completely welcomed me I felt more welcome than any other welcome I've ever had and these five great beings said well you're done you've you've given you've done more than you've contracted for for a lifetime and and so if you want to stay here with us and work from the spiritual side, uh, we'd be happy to have you. But because you're complete, you could, if you decide, 
you'd rather go back, that would be perfectly fine. And at that point, I have no desire one way or the other. I'm just completely neutral, open, and, and I'm going, whoa. And I realize, oh, here I am before these five incredible masters. And I go, okay, well, gee, in your combined wisdom, what would be better? What would be more beneficial, not just to myself, but to everyone concerned? To, for me to stay here with you and work as a spirit guide from this side, or to go back and continue? And there was not even a moment of hesitation. All five of them in chorus unanimously said, if you go back, it would be so much more beneficial to so many more people. Mm-hmm. And so I go, okay, uh, that's all I needed is in this great wisdom, if that's what you know that's true, send me back. And of course, where I am there, there's absolutely not even a thought of pain. <laughs> yeah, there's no thought of death. There's no thought of pain. There's none of that stuff. It doesn't exist. So they go, okay. And the same being that escorted me to the place started escorting me back. And once I'm out of that room and heading back, and I go, oh, all of a sudden, I start to remember I have a body. <laughs> and the last thing I remember is the pain I just couldn't handle. And I'm going, "Uh uh-oh. And so I turn back and I go, hey, you guys, I'm going to need some help. Uh, I'm going to need some healing. Because if I'm in the same condition that I left in, in the body, I'm going to be no good to anybody, including myself. And and I hear somebody go, fine. (laughs) That's all I know. Fine. So these guys are completely economical in their communication. It's just like to the point. It's done. Nothing extra, no flowery stuff, no sugar coating. It's just fine. Okay. So I go, great. They said fine, so it's going to be fine. I come back in the body. I'm still, oh, it's just excruciating pain. And the next thing, I hear this voice in my head that's going, go to the computer now and look up uh, uric acid. And I'm kind of slightly arguing with this voice. I said, hey, I've been told I can get an honorary PhD in gautology and uric acid and purines and everything that has to do with gout. And I've looked up everything I can get my hands on on the Internet. They said, just go look it up. I go, okay. I go look up gout on the Google, and I'm looking down, you know, the regular column of choices, and it's all the same stuff I've already investigated. But then something tells me, kind of taps me on the shoulder, look over here, and it points me to the advertising column, right? On the right side, Mm -hmm. there's the ads. And right at the top of the ad, there's this thing called gout cure. Never seen that before. It's, a, it's an ad for this product, all herbal product. So I click on that, and I get to this website, and you can tell it's kind of a, a startup. It's, it's a new company at that time. And, but then I, I uh, see this thing that says something about the founder of the company and, and what he went through. So I click on that, read the whole thing. Whoa! This guy had it just as bad as I had and, and all over the body. But he, in between having it, um, he went, traveled the world, looked into, you know, how I can't live like this anymore. And I got to find answers. So he found it on a herbal type level. And, and he said, I found these five herbs and... and um, uh, uh, things like garlic and stuff like that, that works together. But it has to be 
in the right proportion, in the right way, together. Well, lo and behold, four out of those five things he listed, I've already been intuitively guided to, and I've been, you know, using it in massive quantities. But it's not all together in the right way. So I read about this more. I go, okay, I'm going to order the product and try to get it, you know, overnight mail. But I live in Mount Shasta. Overnight mail here means two days at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, okay, I, I'm going to, I got to make it through these next two days. And then I see on the bottom of the, the website, email me, the, the founder saying, this is how uh, just new the company is. The founder saying, email me. And so I, I emailed them with, this is where I'm at. And then 15 minutes later, he emails me back a long email with, Step by step, are you doing this? Are you doing that? And starting with, what kind of water are you drinking? And so I answer all his questions. Very long email. He answers me back about an hour later. And step by step, I just decide, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about for once. Somebody who knows more than I do about the situation. So I start following his instructions step by step. And... And uh, the first thing he says, well, when I got into this most excruciating, horrible condition, well, what happened was nothing was helping. So, you know, and in terms of diet and everything, anything I ate made it worse. Even the foods that are supposed to be healing for gout. And so I decided I had this brilliant idea. I'll just stop eating. I'll just drink water. Right? I'll go on a fast. I know how to go on a fast. So I go on a fast. Well, at first, I was very excited because the first, like, two or three hours, I felt better and better. And I go, fantastic. I'll, I'll fast for a day or two or three, whatever it takes to clear this out. Well, about the fourth or fifth hour, it starts to get worse. And by six hours later, I'm just completely the worst it's ever been. By, uh, by exponentially worse. And wow. So I don't know where to go. I mean, I can't eat. I can't not eat. What do I do? And so that's when I died the first time. And when I came back is when I realized, oh, my heart was kick-started when I came back. And then I find this thing, and I'm corresponding with this man, and he said, you did what? <laughs> about when I wrote about my fasting. He said, that's worse than eating a whole cow and drinking tons of alcohol. <laughs> he said, if you're going to fast in, this, in your condition, you might as well go eat a cow and kill yourself. <laughs> and I said, well, I felt like it. And so he said, you've got to eat enough. You have to get enough calories every day. And I go, how do I get enough calories eating lettuce? And especially iceberg lettuce and things like that. And he said, well, here's how you do it. You need protein, but only this kind. So it was incredibly specific. You had to do this, but if you did this without doing the other thing, it made it worse. Holy moly. So I followed his instructions to a T, and lo and behold, within about half a day, I start to feel a little better. Still excruciating pain, but a little better, and a little better. By the next morning, I was a little better. And by two days later, I got the products, start taking those, and... Ah, it got better and better. And within about three or four days, I was in pain, but nothing like I was in. And that was the beginning of my healing from this condition. It took another, another eight months to a year to fully get to a place where, okay, this is how I prevent myself from going there 
again. And uh, I had a few times I went back, but not ever to that degree because I, I knew what to do to get out of it. And uh, so, slowly but surely, over the course of the night, and then I also have uh, my own doctor who's a nutritionist as well, and, and a functional doctor, integrative doctor, and, and very much into, let's take care of this by nutrition and supplements and everything first. So, she helped me a great deal, and then I'm good. So then, I can start to focus on, I'm back from this new assignment, new contract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, now, it's, life is absolutely, completely different. I'm completely reborn, but at the same time, I can't be living the way you know, it's, it's uh, different. The, and I know I don't have an option to die now. I have to fulfill this new contract. I got a new to-do list in life. So I'm going, okay, I better get my health together. And so I'm constantly working on that. And they gave me uh, the choice, okay, when you go back, you don't have to do any of this old stuff, right? It's like you got to start the new thing. But being the way I am, I already had about two years worth of commitments that I had already made before my death experience. So I conferenced with them and said, okay, how would you feel? Can I have a year or two to finish out the contracts, the commitments with people uh, here before uh, and, and while I'm doing that I can start you know, planning for the next step and they said that's fine that's entirely your choice so I said thank you I'm going to do that so I continue they told me already you need to step away from giving private sessions in healing and readings and all of that and focus have your full focus on teaching more people and teaching groups of people, larger groups of people, teaching people all over the world. I was already doing some of that, but they wanted me to focus on that. Drop the private stuff, do all groups and writing and uh, media uh, appearances and things like that so I can teach on a variety of levels from uh, very, very beginners just starting to go maybe I need to you know look into the spiritual stuff all the way to very very advanced people advanced souls who are teachers themselves and and have you know centers themselves and and they need their next steps to get to further places and so I got all that I said okay I can do that so I start doing some of that more and more getting larger groups, various different kinds of groups together and groups of leaders together and certain things got started. But (laughs) within that two-year time, uh, one of those things that I was starting to do with other groups, not my students and people I'm already teaching, but new uh, demographics and new people who were actually already leaders in their own communities. And they got very interested. But uh, as with many of these things, uh, just like with any kind of startups, when you're starting something, it's not the thing so much as the people. And I, didn't, I realized that you know, people in, who have their own leadership things not all of them are as cooperative. <laughs> mm, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. It's like, you know, I'm the head of it, and I'm the only one, and I, everybody has to count out to me, or else mm-hmm. I'm not going to have anything to do with anybody. I ran well, Michael, let me ask you before yes. you go into the, the second session, I, I want to go back to the gout for a second. Yes. 
So, and this happened in 2004, yeah. and, you, and you were speaking with that person that had that product, and he had talked about water. And in 2004, it was a totally different environment than 2018. There's a, a huge conversation about having more alkaline water or having an alkaline diet versus an acidic diet. Yes. Uh, was that covered that you were more acidic and didn't have enough alkaline in your system? That's not the, at that time. the reason for the gout? Not, that, not at that time. That came much later. So, yes, it's a long process sometimes. Uh, and this is something that I think a lot of healers, whether they're professional healers or souls who are here to heal, but they do it through families, they do it through their neighborhood. You know, they don't think of themselves as I'm a healer because they don't have a traditional profession in the healing arts. But they're no less of a healer than anybody who does it professionally. But they are powerful healers. And both uh, segments of the population who are inside, they're all healers, whether they do it professionally or not. And a lot of them sometimes um, run into illnesses and, and very difficult physical conditions themselves. And and then they get kind of stuck. They get, they get uh, like they're failing as a healer. What kind of healer are you if you get sicker than your patients? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, it's just, and then uh, sometimes, especially if they're professional healers, some of their patients go, oh, gee, if my doctor, my chiropractor, my, my natural healer or psychic healer or whatever is so sick, I've got to find somebody else because they're no good. I mean, that's bad publicity. <laughs> so, so a lot of healers get into a quandary because this generally happens either before they start on their healer's path. Right. And that's how they get started on their healing path, by getting extremely sick or whatever, and then coming out of it, healing themselves, and learning how to heal other people but others they've been healers all their lives and they start healing and then after they get to a certain point they need to advance not just as healers but they need to progress as souls on their spiritual path and sometimes when they get to that big big step they get sick or it starts to manifest in various physical or emotional mental conditions. And right. then some of them have a hard time seeking help because they think, I'm a healer. I should be able to heal myself. No. Healing isn't something that happens in isolation. In fact, isolation is what needs to be healed in all of us because Spirit, spirit as a whole, is wholeness itself. It's limitlessness itself. It's eternity. It's complete, undivided awareness itself. So mm -hmm. what are we talking about when we talk about healing? We're talking about the totality, the oneness of spirit beingness. And so that's a really good point because for when you think of gout, uh, you wouldn't think Michael Tamara, a person that knows about diet and, and, and eating good foods. Yes. You wouldn't think you would get gout. Yeah, and that's why whether it's the gout or when I had my heart attacks later or anything, I go to a doctor and if they're a kind, you know, intelligent, wise doctor who really cares about the patient, they get, they get, and they admire my lifestyle and diet and everything I'm doing to keep myself healthy. And they go, they look at the lab results and say, there's nothing I can tell you. You're, they're saying, I deal with people who I can't even talk about having a vegetarian diet. <laughs> because they don't think it's a, it's a diet unless they eat half of a cow. 
<laughs> so that's who I deal with. And so with you, he goes, I'm trying to have the kind of diet you have. I'm trying to have the kind of lifestyle you have. <laughs> and yes. I'm trying to have the kind of lab tests you get. I have no clue why you have gout or why you have uh, uh, heart attacks or why you drop dead or anything like that. And in fact, my uh, cardiologist, my main cardiologist, uh, I really like this guy. Everybody thinks when they see us together, like in a hospital, the first time, um, every nurse at the cardiac care unit, cardiac intensive care unit, these are top-notch nurses. I mean, in, in the backwoods, in any other, you know, like third world country, these would be the top doctors in those places, right? They're so mm -hmm. uh, trained and educated experts and amazing people. I've, I've had amazing people in hospitals. And so every time they come to s introduce themselves to me on their new shift, uh, when I was in for the first heart attack, and they go, they're looking at my charts, but you know they've already gone over the Google. They've Google. Now they don't only look at your uh, medical chart, they Google you online before mm -hmm. they come to see you, doctors and nurses. And they come, they go, can I ask a question? I Sure, of course. Why do you have this doctor, this cardiologist, as your doctor? And I said, oh, I didn't pick him. I mean, I, you know, I was unconscious. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> picked him for me. And why? I thought he was great. And, oh, no, as a doctor, he's tops. But he, the, the first nurse says, in my 25 or 30 years experience as a nurse, I've never worked with a doctor of any specialty that's as allopathic and conservative as they come and traditional. Mm -hmm. And I said, I laughed. And, and he goes, I looked, at you, looked you up on Google. You're a spiritual healer. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I've, you know, worked, attended to other spiritual people, especially spiritual healers and metaphysical people and whatnot. And they don't even want to be caught dead in a hospital. They don't want to have anything to do with doctors. They're all anti-medicine, and health, especially allopathic medicine. But you're here. You're laughing. And you like your doctor. I said, yeah, he's a great person. And he really knows what he's doing as a cardiologist, as a straight-on allopathic cardiologist. And he goes, that's what confuses me. Uh, why are you so different than all the other spiritual people I've worked with? And I said, because I am spiritual. I am metaphysical. I am psychic. And most of my friends are. And I know some of the top psychics, psychic healers, everybody, spiritual healers. When I need them, I'll go to them. But right now, I need somebody to patch me up physically. That's mm -hmm. the strength of allo allo allopathy. And, and this guy is tops in doing that. And he knows it. We get along because he knows it. He knows that I don't fit the profile. And he tells me, I can't do anything about that because, you know, you don't fit. And I love that because, uh, except... Um, I've, been, I've seen and heard of doctors who go, because I'm the doctor, I'm going to tell you what to do, regardless, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to experiment on you and try this, try that, and, and you know, you might get worse, but, well, I'm the doctor. I said, I'm not going to work with a doctor like that. But I can work with a doctor who's honest and says, I don't know anything about that. So you're, going to, you're on your own. Good luck. Right? Or gee, well, this diet is seemingly helping you because your blood tests show it. Keep with it. 
I don't know anything to tell you about it, but I know it's working for you. Keep at it. That's the kind of doctor, allopathic doctor, I can work with. And the guy goes, the nurse says, wow, I never thought of that. He says, <laughs> thank you. That makes all the sense in the world. I said, this happens. This, this um, elitism and this, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, Philistinism, <laughs> and, mm. and, you know, uh, happens both on the scientific as well as on the religious, as well as on the spiritual, metaphysical side. Yeah, yeah. We're all the same. Yeah. You know, we can get stuck in, in isolationism and say, no, my way is the only way. So if you don't like it, go, go take the highway. You know? Yeah. And that's not going to help us really heal. Healing requires all of us. Just like someone said, it takes a village to, to raise a child. Well, what does it mean to raise a child? It means the same as healing. It also means the same as spiritual growth. To me, healing, raising a child, or being on your spiritual path and growing spiritually, exactly the same. Uh -huh. they're, not the diff they're not different in any way. Because healing is restoring. I love the dictionary definition of healing. Restoring to wholeness. It doesn't mm -hmm. say restoring yourself or restoring somebody else or restoring the world. It just says restoring to wholeness. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, Michael, I got to give a shout out to my homegirl, Lisa, who back about 10 years ago, she introduced yes. me to Louise Hay. And I'm sure you're familiar with Louise Hay. And, you know, God yes. bless her, she passed away last year. And yes. um, one thing that I loved about the introduction to her was her book, You Can Heal Your Life. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. And they always talk about uh, an issue that a person may have, but here's the underlying issue, meaning more of a spiritual issue. And as you were talking, I was looking up gout. And it reads that uh, the situation is the need to dominate or impatience or anger. Ah, yes. All three would fit. <laughs> <laughs> At least in my case. Ah, so it resonates. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's something that I've had to go. A lot of healing happens in layers. So this definition of restoring to wholeness, we never have to heal that part of ourselves that's already whole. Only the part of ourselves that's divided. And when I say part of ourselves that's divided, what part of ourselves can actually be divided when we are already 100% grade A spirit? Mm -hmm. We're spirit through and through. We can't be. Who I am is spirit. And I know this completely beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm spirit, you're spirit, we're all spirit through and through 100%. There's not one, quote, part of us that's not spirit. So, how do we get divided? Ah, the question is, what part of us, what do we divide in ourselves? Is like that huh, stuff that most people don't want to hear, especially a doctor tell you, uh, especially if the doctor's not a psychiatrist says, oh, it's all in your head. <laughs> right? Nobody wants to hear, uh, especially a more aware, capable, uh, health conscious, you know, uh, spiritually more aware person doesn't want to hear, it's all in your head. But it is. Not in your head, but it's in your mind. People, mostly, even though now they're starting to talk more and more about mind over matter, mind medicine, and things like that, 
but they don't have it all away because they don't recognize the mind is limitless. And, and spirit, how much spirit, you as spirit, occupy your mind is how whole you are here in the body, in this world. And this world actually includes the, the more, you know, uh, astral type of psychic world. So, so there's only one mind. There's only one spirit. But we can make decisions in the one mind to pretend, to imagine we're divided, that I'm separate from you. All of spiritual growth is about restoring our mind to the wholeness of spirit. Another word I can use for mind when it's divided is consciousness. That's why every human being, until you master your mind and become enlightened, fully awakened to the spiritual wholeness, nature, limitlessness, that we are is divided. That's what makes us, quote, human. We think of ourselves as individuals. And there think, is... Go ahead. I think that's my other takeaway from, you know, we're, we're still talking about the first one. I don't, I don't want to jump through and I want to, you know, spend time on each one because, you know, this isn't something that happens every day, right? Oh, and, you mean dropping dead? But what you just said was so huge. It, it reminded me of, uh, of all things wrestling because when you were coming back, they were content, like, okay, well, he, let's see if he's going to stay separate from us. And he's experiencing all this pain. It wasn't until you asked, hey, I need some additional help. And they were like, fine. But until you asked, you probably would have <laughs> still been in pain today. You know, well, so I think the yeah. takeaway is the communi- constant communication with them or the re- increase in the relationship with them. Yes, and I'm aware, just like you said, uh, reading from uh, Louise Hayes' book, uh, gout, she says this, is, um, what was it, anger and, and uh, domination. Yeah, it's um, and, um, the need to dominate impatience and anger. Impatience, anger. Well, all those things pretty much are the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> resentment and regret. Uh, uh, I heard somebody else tell me that cow was based on regret. But, well, if you're in regret, you're going to be angry, right? You, you're feeling the regret so much more that you don't notice the anger. Just like people who are so afraid, they don't know. They don't notice the anger. They're concentrated on the fear. But, and then people who are so afraid, they're not aware of the fear. That's why they're angry. No yeah. one's ever angry if they're not afraid first. Yeah. And why would you be afraid? What is anyone truly afraid of? It's not yeah, physical, no. physical injury. I'll, I'll yeah. tell you that. I know that. It's not physical mm-hmm. injury. Because... Uh, you wanted to know more about my other deaths, right? <laughs> the second death, what happened just about when I, one day, I said, okay, I, you remember two years of commitments from the past that I wanted to finish up here with people. And one day I said, I'm finished. Okay, I'm walking, that's the point when I said, I'm walking away from doing all kind, any type of uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, private sessions of healing mm-hmm. and all that. It took my office and Raphael another four or five years handling phone calls for private sessions before wow. it started to become now once a year, once a couple times a year that somebody calls for that. But, <laughs> but they had to deal with 
anger and <laughs> domination and all kinds of things from other people desperate yeah. to get the, the private sessions. So mm-hmm. I really appreciate what they did for me. But that freaked me up from, okay, I can go on and devote my life to teaching and writing. And so, so then the second time, <laughs> the second death happened during a heart attack. Uh, a few days after I finished all my commitments with those people I had from the past, private sessions and all of it, one night, I'm, uh, Rafi and I'm invited by this other healer uh, for a birthday party at his healing sanctuary for another well-known healer and author. Um, and so we go, we're having, oh, we get a night off. We get to celebrate somebody's birthday. And we've never met this person in person before. So we're going to have fun uh, about an hour and a half drive from here. And so we have this, and they have nice food, very organic, everything's healthy. And this, they, they bring out the cake, candles for this guy, and sing happy, we all sing happy birthday. And they tell him, okay, close your eyes, make a wish, blow out the candles. We all clap and everything. And then, lo and behold, well, somebody earlier on in the evening when I arrived found out my birthday was going to be in four days. And so they secretly went out, got another cake, and put all the candles, which is, at my age, it's like a forest fire. And, <laughs> and they bring out this forest fire ca- cake to me, and that was a total surprise. And she goes, okay, uh, happy birthday. You have to close your eyes, make your wish. And so I, I obediently close my eyes, and I'm in a great deal of amusement. And I'm thinking, uh, okay, what shall I wish for for this year? And my mind goes completely blank, empty. It's not the kind of blank where you have a mind freeze. No, it's blank. It's total peace. And I'm just like, wow. No, not, not a thought. Not even, wow, this is great. It's just peace, blank. And then... In the middle of this, and this blankness is kind of a fuzzy darkness. It's kind of a warm and fuzzy darkness. And from the middle of this, it starts to have this beautiful golden light that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is all happening within, you know, seconds of me closing my eyes. And then it fills in that whole fuzzy warm blackness, and it gets to this incredible gold golden light and I recognize oh this is the blue blossoming of the Christ force the Christ consciousness and I'm going oh that's a that's the first thought I had is oh yeah that could be my wish I would like to embody the Christ consciousness much more and I was very happy what a great wish. And I open my eyes, blow out the candles, everybody claps and sings happy birthday and everything. And it's all merriment. So the rest of the evening goes on and um, we go home. Raphael, meanwhile, doesn't tell me anything about what she experienced when I was blowing out the candles. That came like days after I get out of the hospital after my death experience. And she tells me, she says, well, I didn't want to tell you this before, but I think I better. During the candle blowing, before the candle blowing thing, uh, you might have not seen me for a few minutes. Well, our host, the healer, wanted to show me the, the sanctuary, the healing room. And he explained all the crystals and this and that, the other thing. But the thing that got to Raphael was, he said, Oh, yeah, uh, whatever months ago, I had a heart attack in here. <laughs> yeah, but he said, I knew I had to heal myself, so I locked myself in and wouldn't let the paramedics come, wouldn't let my girlfriend uh, call anybody. And he said, I made it through, and here I am. 
And Raphael's going, God, why is he telling me this at this point? Well, she goes out, and then, oh, there's the candle blowing. She said she got scared because when I blew out the candles, she saw me leave. <clears throat> and she said, you were going. And, and not in the way of being spaced out. You were going. And she said, I didn't know when, but it wasn't going to be that far down the line. And she, that's why she just didn't even want to talk about it. Yeah. And then, so, so the next morning, she's already up. What wakes me up is, brings me back to the body more, is the clanking of the uh, dog water bowl that she's washing in the kitchen. And so I slowly come to, but I'm in bliss. I was already in this place of bliss in the heavens, if you will. And then I come back and I start to vaguely have an awareness of a body in the bed. But I'm still in total bliss, no thought. Just as being aware of the sounds. And then the first thought was, oh, that's Raphael in the kitchen. And then the next thought that pops in, I have an important... Uh, meeting at 10 o'clock at the office in town, which is like a two-minute drive from home. So I'm in no hurry, but but I go, I start, I better get out and start to get ready. Because this man came all the way from Israel to find me. So um, I wanted to make sure to meet him. And so I get out of bed, I take a couple of steps, and it's like an energetic earthquake under my feet. I don't know what's going on. Everything is shaking. Everything is light, like a lightning show. I don't have a whole lot of pain or anything, but discomfort in my back, shoulders, head, everywhere, legs, and it's just like my whole world is falling apart. And so, so I get down from this bliss state more to my body and just then Raphael walks in and she goes oh my god are you having a heart attack and I used to be a nurse when I was in my teens to about 20 a little over 20 years old and I'm thinking back what's the symptomology of heart attack well I didn't have any of them that I knew or I was taught back way back when now some of these symptomologies are included. But back then, it was if you don't have a crushing chest pain and radiating uh, pain down your left arm, that's not a heart attack. So I told her, and the funny thing, I'm trying to get my amusement, so I'm picturing a pink elephant sitting on my ch chest because that's the layman's symptomology that nurses learn is it feels like an elephant sitting on your chest. I didn't have that. And I'm laughing to myself, in spite of all this, that I'm having a pink elephant sitting on my chest, but if the elephant was really chest there, I would be dead and crushed. And I'm kind of making a joke to myself. Yeah. So, so I tell Ravi, no, I don't think so. But it's my kundalini. It's going haywire. And, and I couldn't even tell her that I was in this total bliss state before this experience. So it must be related. But I ask her, but I, I feel like I really need a healing right away. And she goes, okay, I'm going to go sit down in the living room and settle the uh, animals. The animals were going berserk. They, they are tuned in to me, right? And mm -hmm. so she calms them down while she's starting to give me a healing. When I walk out into the living room, this is something I have no recollection of. She said, the first thing I did, I walked around in circles around the coffee table or the dining uh, I mean the living room and she said I started chanting the, the uh, Jewish prayer for the dead and that freaked her out and when I later when she told me that and I asked her how possibly could you have known the Jewish prayer of the dead she said that's the other strange thing Three days before, 
I was just flipping through the channels on TV, came across this PBS program, very interesting. And they were talking about something to do with Hebrew, you know, something in Jewish uh, uh, religious things. And they said, and this is the Jewish prayer for the dead. And the cantor started to chant the whole uh, Jewish prayer for the dead. She says, that's the only reason I recognized it right away when you start to do that. And I said, I have no recollection of doing that. And I don't know one word of Jewish. <laughs> or Hebrew. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she goes, well, that's what you did. And interesting, isn't it? I was going to, my attention was on meeting this man from Israel who was a doctor and a medical scientist who started, who's the president of a medical supplies company that made stents and other products for people with heart problems. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Meanwhile, she said, after I did the, the chanting, I, I remember this part, I said, Raphael, I need to go outside. It was a beautiful spring, beautiful spring day, warm, and our backyard was probably in the best lawn condition it's ever been just emerald green right so I saw that out the window I said I gotta go out there I need the sunshine I go downstairs and then when I get on the lawn I collapse my head's on the on the lawn I'm not passed out or I'm not um, dead I, my heart didn't stop then I, I'm still aware the body is breathing and everything but I'm 99% out of the body and when I get out, I notice I'm circled by five of those same magnificent beings that met me in that conference room in the first near-death experience. But there's another uh, five or six, seven of them. I think there was about 12 of them uh, circling around me, putting me in the center, me out of the body as soul, in the center, and they're all around me. And boy, what, that, that was that great. And I just came out of the body knowing that uh, my body's in trouble. And I go, thank God you guys are here. And then they step back. No words. They step back like about 15 feet further away from me. That was a complete, I had total clarity. We're here for you, but we can't interfere. We can't intervene. We're not going to save you. Oh, <laughs> darn. <laughs> and so I'm going, okay, could I have a hint? What do I need to do? And one of them spoke up in my mind and said, it's your time to make a choice. And this is one of the most important choices you've ever made in your life. And no one... You have to be the one to make that choice. And then that's it. No other communication. And I'm going, okay, that's a start, a choice. What kind of choice? Well, obviously, I knew right away, obviously it was a choice about life. But I already made my choice about coming back here or staying in spirit the last time. But do I make that choice again? No. I got, no, that's not it. That's, that choice is already made. So I'm going, I've already made that choice, and I haven't, I've barely started on my new commitment to being here in the body. So I can't be dropping dead. This is a whole different scenario. I've got I to gotta keep it together here, and I've got to find out what is this new decision, new choice I have to make about life. The first thing I'm looking at, well, most people would think I'm in a life or death situation. But I've already been through that because I know even before that experience, I knew there's no death. I knew when I leave here, it's just a leaving. I'm going to continue as spirit. But with my first near-death experience, that's complete fact, you know, solid. And, and I experienced I know it in my body, so to speak, that that's true. 
But, so that's not the decision. Then I, it hit me. Oh, even though I know all this, and I have my certainty, but I've still been, up to now, I've still been living my life from birth till when I, when I drop the body and go on as spirit. I'm still looking at that segment of life as my life right now. So if I drop that, I already know life is before birth and way after life, after death, and it's not different between, between birth and physical death and before and after. No, my life as spirit is the same. Oh, okay. I, that's my choice. I have to choose to live life. I have to choose life regardless of the body one way or the other. Whether I come back to the body or I don't come back to the body. That's okay. That's no problem. Ah, but what else is there if I make this choice? And that's where I ran into the big boogie boo. For me, anyway. And I think it would be for a lot of people. When I go past the body or no body, okay, what's the other possibilities? If I come back, and what if the body is incapacitated till, through its death, and it's going to be some years of not being able to function? Oh, or even not being able to function at my optimum. Ah, now that is not so easy of a decision to make. What if I come back, just as an example, and I find that I, want, I went blind. I'm still going to live in a body. I don't have that choice of leaving because I've got to finish this stuff. But I'm blind now. Or, huh, how about, I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and things, or I'm, you know, I'm only half capacity. Oh. So I start, I have to, and this is while my heart attack is still going on. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult. Hmm. It's incredibly simple when you're completely out of the body. There's nothing to it. But yeah. when you're, you know, even part way in and here and you're experiencing all this stuff on a body level, it's like, okay, I know all this, but even so, it's still difficult, right? Because everything in that aspect of myself that still thinks of itself as separate, that's why no matter how many times I have a near-death experience, the part of me that leaves and dies completely and is out there is already already free. It's already free. There's no problem up there. It's the part of me that is still believes separate, is separate. It's in that lower part of the mind. That's not up there where I go when I go up there after death. Ah, and this is the part that goes through what the Catholics called purgatory. The rest of me is in heaven. But this part is in purgatory with a, a foot in hell, right? <laughs> when, you're, when you're experiencing and really think, believe that you're going through pain and suffering of a very you know, bad kind, you, you think... It's, it's real. That's the part of the mind that's separate from the rest of the mind. And who made it separate? No one but me. Mm-hmm. And it's up to that part of me that's already in heaven. Where I'm going, body? What body? Who cares? Huh. Right? That part of me has to look back down at the other part in this vastness of mind and go, 
Oh, I left a part of my spiritness back there in the idea that I'm separate. <laughs> and, and that's why, oh, if you've ever uh, looked into shamanism, one of the big things about shamanism in a lot of different cultures is retrieving part of the soul that got left behind. Mm -hmm. That's what they're really talking about. Yeah. The soul is never really divided. It's the, the picture, the idea that you put in this limitless mind that makes an artificial division. And then you feed yourself into it. You invest part of you as a soul, spirit soul, into it. And, and you go, wow, I am different. I am separate. I'm not like you at all. And like that. And we start to add to it, add to it, add to it. We add to it so much that for a while in the very, very beginning stages of a soul's spiritual evolutionary growth process here as a human being that soul 100% believes I am this body if you do something to this body you've done it to me and I'm going to do it back to your body And it's funny you say that because there's a TV show out now called Lucifer and you were talking about purgatory and that's all every episode you know besides all the flash and everything is showing how we are separating ourselves from the totality of everything yes so it really resonates but let yeah, me that's good. as you were talking about heart attack I definitely want to go back to Louise Hay and read about heart attack yeah because I want to see if it resonates so with heart attack it says or let me say with heart problems, and then I'll read heart attack. So heart okay. problems is longstanding emotional problems, lack of joy, hardening of the heart, belief in strain and stress. Yes. And with attack, it's squeezing all of the joy out of the heart in favor of money or position, et cetera. Uh-huh. Yes. I would, I would say that's, at least in my experience, that's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. so, so again what am I dealing with here uh, the part of the heart attack once I was down there and where the beings are surrounding me that choice I had to make I realized was for eternal life not from mm -hmm. birth till death but to live here in this body what I know as eternal life life there's no way out called death because I already know that's not the end so I can't pretend that oh if this pain gets really bad or if this situation gets really bad I'll just croak and get out of here I can't cop out like that anymore so what does that mean in terms of actually living here is Eternal life can only be lived without conditions. Condition is the condition of separation. So, so that's what I'm realizing. This is before my near-death experience. What I had with the, the great beings, the masters there, was not my near-death experience. My heart didn't stop. That happened in the, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital that can handle me, right? So, <laughs> so this is, you know, uh, that's why you can't even begin to cover even one of these death experiences in an hour radio show. Yeah, or absolutely. Conversation. <laughs> but because there's so much going on, so... So once I came back to the body, once I made that choice, how I made that choice is I go, well, I know this choice has to be made. I have to make this choice sooner or later. Do I want to wait until next lifetime?
to make this choice or five lifetimes later? No. I'll make it now because I'm back. I'm back to do this. So if I came back to do this and I have my commitment, I'm going to find out. I'm going to learn how to keep my body alive, healthy and alive enough so I can really finish this new commitment I've made. And the commitment I made isn't to those great beings or to God. It's commitment I made to myself. Mm -hmm. There's no one else. And God doesn't make you do these things. All right? And so, so then I decide better do it now. I said, okay, here's my opportunity. You're giving it to me on a silver platter. I'll, I'll do it. I'm committed to live the eternal life here and now. So I come back. I feel better. I get back in the body. And I'm able to run upstairs. And, but I'm, I still kind of shaky need and a little weak. And I still kind of trying to get my bearings. So I'm still going at this guy coming to meet me from Israel at 10 o'clock. Raphael said, oh no, I already rescheduled him for, you know, a few days from now. He's perfectly fine with it. Oh, okay, great, thanks. But um, I, I still want to go into the office and see that's the dominant, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, I got to do it this way and all that stuff is there. And, that and uh, I said, I still have to go to the office. She goes, and she's being very, uh, uh, what would you say, clever, and, and says, okay. And I said, but I need, a tr- I need a ride. Could you take me there? She goes, of course. So the animals in us, or at least the dog and, and us, go on the car. We go, and halfway there to the office, she goes, well, you seem to be in a much better condition, so how about if we make a little detour to the ER on the way to the office? <laughs> Yeah. Get you checked out for sure that you're mm-hmm. you're good. I said, and what I do is I look to spirit always to make these important choices because it was completely when I went started this whole thing went outside it was you have to make this decision and I knew if I was being ambulanced to a hospital I wouldn't be able to have the space to meditate and make my decision. So that's why I made that decision to go outside. And and so then, at this point, however, while she's driving me, I get a total green light. Yes, you're free to go to the hospital. So I said, great, take me to the ER. And so we go through a whole thing there. But um, basically what the ER doc said for to shorten this whole thing up is, huh, I would die any moment unless she gave me this very strong truck intravenously, uh, which she said I had to sign a a waiver because it had a 50-50 chance. It had a 50% chance of killing me. (laughs) I said, I laughed. I literally laughed. And I said, do you know how ridiculous that sounds? (laughs) I'm basically 100% alive right now. Yeah. That you're gonna try to, you're gonna give me this drug to cut that down in half. <laughs> and she says, "No, you don't understand. If I don't give it to you, you have a hundred percent chance of dying any second now." <laughs> I said, "Well, I knew I had not died in all those minutes or whatever it took out there, but." I'm, at that point, I'm seeing everything in divinity. It's, it's just the wholeness of spirit. Everything. Even if people were unconscious, even if this doctor doesn't really know what's going on, everything is in sync. Everything is in divine choreography. Nothing could possibly go wrong. So, of course I'm laughing, and I'm going, okay, I'll sign. You're the doctor. Let's do it your way. 
and she did it and I can tell how something improved inside and we're waiting we had to she calls the cardiologist in another uh, bigger city hospital and she said we can't handle you here this is just a temporary thing to keep you alive until we can get you to a hospital that can take care of you I said thank you she said but it's going to take an hour and a half to for the ambulance to get here and the, the crew I said I saw four ambulances at the front of this ER mm-hmm. she said yeah none of them's equipped plus we don't have a trained crew who can keep you alive until you get there I said okay she says basically when you have an EKG like that you're dead <laughs> and she said we're trying to keep you alive to, so that you can stay alive I said, I'm all for that. This time, I'm all for that. I'll go for that. So we we have a fun time talking, and then they take me away, and boy, the relief that she went through once I was rolled out of her her ER. She did not want me dropping dead on her watch. (laughs) So I got handed over. It's in the middle of this ambulance ride to the other hospital, through the mountain pass with Raphael driving 70, 75 miles an hour in her big SUV to keep up with the ambulance. The young guy who's tending to me looks so young, I thought, he looked like a, maybe he could be a sophomore in high school. And I said, how long have you been doing this? And he says, oh, next week I get my licensing exam. <laughs> I laughed. I said, great, because I knew he isn't going to miss anything. His license is on the, on the line. He has to, he's keeping an eagle eye on me. Now, he's not going to let me croak, right? But he's scared. So, you know, he's a, he's a student. And so I knew that his mentor was in the front seat talking about golf or something with the driver but I wanted to reassure him and so I said kid I'm not going to croak on you relax and then I went flat line (laughs) 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 of course I didn't know that until I came back so I started leaving I leave through the, uh, the roof of the ambulance and then I'm just like oh wow this is total freedom and I look at the sky I'm still in this physical realm but completely out of my body I can see the ambulance and then I look I see Raphael's car behind me and I look down and lo and behold there's Raphael driving her car following me and again there's not a thought of death or how Raphael must be feeling I'm I'm just in joy and I'm going hey Raviel I'm up here and she's very psychic and sensitive she looks right at me while she's driving she's white knuckling you know she's holding on to that steering wheel so hard it's like a death grip and trying to stay up with the keep up with the ambulance and she sees me and she just goes white because hey she's clairvoyant she know what it means when your husband who's being rushed to a bigger hospital because he's in such bad condition and you see him completely out of the body oh my god right so she's she takes her left hand off of the steering wheel and she's part looking at me and part keeping her eyes on the road and she's shaking her fist at me (laughs) he's not a happy camper (laughs) and so then I'm looking at that, interpreting it. Oh, she's angry. She's angry at me. And I thought, I better, I better get back because, <laughs> because if, she, if I don't, she's going to kill me. <laughs> and I'm making this joke to myself. And, and so then, next thing, I'm in the celestial realm. And there's five golden, gigantic golden beings waiting for me in the semicircle. And as I get close to them, one of them comes down. 
to meet me. And as that one comes down to meet me, she gets right by me, and then she turns into a she. She turns into a, an angel, a female angel. And who looks like, at the, afterwards I thought, she looked like a cross between, you know, the woman at the beginning of the Columbia Records, or Columbia Studios movies, you know, holding the yeah. torch, a little bit like yeah. the Statue of Liberty. And, and, and uh, the Mona Lisa, Da Vinci, da Vinci's Mona Lisa, if you combine the two, you kind of had the looks of this angel. But oh. she was absolutely magnificent. And total, 100% love, compassion, kindness, gentleness. And she puts her, she goes, like, bad boy. <laughs> and she says, it's not time yet. It's not your time. Puts both hands on my chest of the astral body and starts to push me back to the physical. And she pushes me back all the way down. Now I'm in the physical realm. And then she pushes me back through the roof of the ambulance and down into the physical body. And I could almost hear the click as she pushes me back into the body. And once that happens, I hear the young man, the paramedic, to be screaming at the front guys, he's back, he's back. And I open my eyes. And he's got the, the paddles, uh, uh, <laughs> the defibrillator paddles in his thing. He was just about to paddle me because I flatlined. So I wasn't gone for, you know, more than a few seconds, I'm sure. And, but, but uh, so that was my actual near-death experience where the heart actually stopped and I was completely out of the body for a few <laughs> seconds or whatever. But I knew, you know, I wasn't trying to go out, but I just did. And, and that's why I told, oh, when I was out there, I told that angel on, while she's bringing me back and saying, you know, it's not your time yet. I said, yeah, I know it's not my time. So I, it's okay to visit once in a while, right? And she goes, and pushes me back in the body. So <laughs> I thought, yeah, I, I got to get it together here. I got to be, you know, able to stay and see this through. So, you try to get in a VIP, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then um, I get taken to the hospital. When they check me out, uh, they rush me right into the surgery, and the anesthesiologist, the cardiologist, everybody's waiting for me. And um, they say, oh, they check me out, another EKG. Yeah, you did have a heart attack, but you're fine now so let's watch you overnight I said great less to do the better it is so they put me into uh, cardiac intensive care and that's when those doc uh, those nurses were coming and telling me you know how interesting that you have such a allopathic cardiologist but this thing you were talking about what may cause a heart attack that's again that part of myself as spirit that's still hung up on believing these images in the mind. Mm -hmm. And the images are what contains the concepts like, oh, you know, uh, I can't deal with this. That's, that's an image. There's emotion in it, there's thoughts in it, and there's an image of an experience. We, we as souls, we're like photojournalists that record everything. Every thought, every to choice, every uh, feeling, every experience, every action, everything. All experiences that we go through, we record like an ongoing 24-7 uh, uh, monitor, like they have in surveillance, you know, thing. But it's your whole life. And a copy of that is what's recorded in what's called uh, Akashic Records. But yeah. we also have it here. And it's in, essentially, it's in a certain, certain aspect of our mind, right? So, so then, if I had created even 
15 lifetimes ago, if I had created this total inability where I'm so enraged with somebody who killed my wife or child or whatever, and, and it's just, I'm going to kill you if it's the last thing I do uh, on the planet type of a thing. Well, I created those images. And it's not until I revisit them in one way or another that I start to take my energy back saying, no, I don't think I want to go there anymore. I'm done with that. That's what forgiveness really is, is you seeing the truth that what I thought was true wasn't. It was just an image I created about my experience. And it's full of judgment. It's full of anger, hatred, fear, whatever, apathy, you name it. We imbue it with life. It's like that old Bible story, you know, of Genesis. God breathing into Adam's nostril, breathing life into him. We do that every single day as spirit. We breathe. Spirit is the only thing, only beingness, if you will, that can breathe life into anything, into a body. So when you really understand this, you'll recognize that a simple little image in your mind, you know, you imagine something, there's an image. That's an image in your mind. You create it. Now, that level of creating, you haven't decided to imbue it with life. Imbue it with yourself. When God imbues Adam's body with life, breathes into it, he's imbuing Adam with spirit. That's why the Hebrew word for spirit is breath. I think it's also some other ancient language uh, spirit is the same word as breath. And so then, every day, as we decide on something, we're creating an image. As we fantasize, we're creating an image. As we imagine the possibility, as dream, I want to, I, I have a dream, and my dream is everyone walking hand in hand, no matter what your color is, all that kind of stuff. It's an image. Everything. Just like we all know the engineer that designed the Golden Gate Bridge or the Manhattan Bridge or whatever started with the image. That engineer had an image. The, st the artist who's, who made the Statue of Liberty had that image in their mind to produce it. That's how all things are produced here in this world from an image. But it's how much life do you put into it? How much of yourself as spirit do you imbue that image, your creation, into that? And that's the extent to which you basically uh, reap the benefits or pay the the reaper, <laughs> be the, the karma, is how much of your life force did you imbue into the image of vengeance, the image of I'm going to get justice. And it's really not about justice, it's about vengeance. The image of I'm so angry at you, I can kill you, even if you don't. Okay? Now, when one is able to forgive, when I'm able to forgive, I remind myself right away, even if I create that image because somebody really gets me angry, ah, do I want to live with that? No, thank you. Do I want to suffer? No, thank you. Then I better blow that image. I better forgive that image. Okay? What am I doing when I forgive someone? There's nothing in that other person to actually forgive. Actually, even if that person killed you or killed you in another lifetime or killed somebody you love. It's the image you create 
that's going to make you suffer. So forgiveness is even the things that provoked my heart attacks and gout and all of that stuff, I would say 99%, even maybe more. I got myself down to where I don't have those kinds of thoughts and feelings where I am now. Okay? I haven't in a while. But that doesn't mean there's still little parts of me that I gave use to give life to those moments, you know, heated moments, you know, when you just want to kill somebody or when you wanted to die because you were blaming yourself for doing something so horrendous or something you didn't mean for it to happen or some of the things, maybe on another time, we can talk about some of the other life death experiences. But uh, on one of the times where I didn't die, but I'm in the ambulance, I came to this total realization. When you're not sp- afraid of physical death anymore, you have the luxury to contemplate in a, when you're being carted away in an ambulance. Hmm, if I go now, is there anything I'm more afraid of than physical death? And I got my answer instantaneously it was failure but on the surface that doesn't you know I've failed all kinds of times and I don't have any trouble doing things over and over because I couldn't get it done the first time and I didn't do it right the first time that's failure right that kind of failure no problem ah but what was the problem why was I so afraid of failure No, it's not the failure that I am afraid of. No, failure, I can fail left and right in many, many, many ways, and I don't have a problem with it. But it's certain things that's considered maybe failure. But why those failures is, oh, it took me a while. I got the answer in the back of an ambulance, but it took me about probably two, three years to get the full import of that answer and to be able to realize the truth rather than, you know, which means really letting go, letting go, letting go of all kinds of times way back a hundred lifetimes ago, two hundred lifetimes ago, that I wasn't where I am now in consciousness and very limited and I made these vows I made I ground myself and punished myself to the ground because I was a doctor and I couldn't save and I was a doc you know you were talking about uh, reputation or something there was another term about the heart attack um, your your status or credibility or mm-hmm. something like that uh, right. well hey there was a couple of lifetimes way back when one of them it took me a long time to get to and a long time to forgive myself was I was a noted physician I was one of those uh, as a doctor like a superstar doctor right could do no wrong don't don't go too deep into that one because I know we're coming up on time and I want to respect your time oh okay Um, (laughs) so anyway (laughs) But I think the theme, it, 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 at least in this life, is, you know, our introductory classes where we had to learn to uh, blow images and blow pictures. That's correct. And, right? Yep. So it always goes back to the foundation. It, um, it was a pleasure, again, speaking with you, Mike. <laughs> Michael, I, I do want to have you on, you know, have you on ongoing guest, and maybe we'll talk <laughs> about your, your silver platter because many people have to reincarnate to go through these <laughs> challenges, and you're, you don't have to go through childhood and adolescence in your... <laughs> Oh, a little bit here and there, but <laughs> that part's been the more minor parts. Uh, <laughs> especially. Oh, yeah, let, let's let's keep it going because we, we want to cover two, and, and we've covered a lot of ground, but I think our audience really likes you, and, and I think that uh, David and I appreciate you taking the time to come out on our podcast as well. Yeah. Oh, you 
You want to keep going? No, no, no. I think we're going to end it for today. Yeah, because I think we've been on for over an hour and a half. That's yeah. way long enough for anybody. It's You can only take so much of this. <laughs> well, it goes back to those classes where, you know, you're holding space and you're there for a couple of hours, but the new people that come in there, they can't sit still for five minutes. So oh, yeah. you know, we don't yeah. want to do that to the YouTube audience either. No, no. We don't want to subject them to un, uh, uh, what would you call it, unfair, uh, cruel, uh, unfair and cruel punishment. <laughs> 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 Unusual punishment, unjust punishment, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So with that, with that, we're going to hold off. Uh, you guys have been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And Michael, it was a pleasure. Let, let's definitely stay in touch and have you back on to the podcast. Okay. It was a great uh, pleasure for me as well, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Listen to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective on Radio Public. It's a free, easy-to-use app that helps listeners like you find and support shows like ours. When you listen to our show on Radio Public, we receive direct financial support every time you hear an episode. Experience our show and Radio Public today by listening to the show link in our episode notes, and thank you for listening. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at 